Light within our hearts. Light within our thoughts. Light within our words. Be one and all and everything. Blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. With me today on the show, I have my friend David Slater, and the topic we came up with to discuss, uh, to address to some extent today, I guess, innovation, in a, ingenuity, imagination. Yes. It's all about taking something that's never been seen before, probably something from inside our minds and hearts, and bringing it out where it can be shared, uh, rather than doing everything in the way it's always been done, and thereby being no more than what we've ever been, to instead say, no, there is more of me beyond this. I just don't happen to know what it is. And there's more of you beyond this, and I don't happen to know what that is, but I think if we are open to what is different and new, if we're willing to imagine and build and invent, that we could create an entirely new universe within which to live. I, You know, there was a point at which no one thought about traveling to the moon. <laughs> You know, there was a point at which uh, the whole notion of a rocket ship going to the moon was totally ridiculous. Uh -huh. And yet someone wrote the stories and let their imagination run wild. And 50, 60 years later, we're doing it. I like the pithy little statement that I've been seeing a lot recently is, don't tell me the sky's the limit when there are footprints on the moon. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's a, a, an amazing concept. Something I've reflected on recently is uh, I choose to live with a spiritual concept in my life. I guess is the best way to to say spiritual. However you want to uh, a spiritual concept of a particular spiritual concept or mine. Um, meaning, I, I allow spirituality to be a part of my day. Okay. Whatever that's going to be. The, the thing that I think is at the heart of it is I've realized how limited my imagination is. Now, I was always the kid that was always what, talking. What limits the imagination? Aha, experience. What okay. I have found is as I allow for anything to happen in a day, what I could imagine, uh, uh, great way to experience it, six months ago, I could not imagine what today holds. Okay. And what I mean is not by the specifics, but by the, uh, the vast wonder, wonderment of an experience, the experience of today. Um, the, I have friends here. I have people that I'm interacting with that six months ago wouldn't have been a concept in my life. Okay. So my imagination could not stretch to fit what my experience gives me in a day. And every new person you meet is going to bring new possibilities into your life. Limitless possibilities. Which, on the flip side of that, I always find it a bit peculiar when I meet uh, single adults who wish to have uh, a special significant someone in their lives, mm -hmm. but they're specifically looking for someone who will not change anything <laughs> about the way they are living life or where, where they are living or anything. You know, I'm, I'm very comfortable with my life. I'm comfortable with my job. I'm comfortable with my home. But I want there to be someone there with me. But they don't want that person to bring anything that will in any way upset the balance of what they already have. And I kind of scratch my head and, and say, well, you could get a, a, a puppet or a, a doll to sit on the shelf, I suppose, but you cannot invite a real person into that situation without embracing change. Isn't it funny? The one constant in the universe, which tells you exactly how humorous everything is, is change. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for a constant, and the one we find is change. I find immense humor 
to that. And if we don't embrace it, if we don't seek it, if we don't allow it, we're fighting. We're, we're like the, the fish that's afraid of water. Mm. Um, life is change, and that's exactly what it is. And if uh, another... Uh, I mean, I, I don't mean to devalue him. I'm just making no. this as a side comment, but... Uh, it was it was kind of a, a running gag initially between myself and my former life partner. We're still good friends, but our our lives overlap for nine years, going in opposite directions. I think, but it, but the beginning of that time, uh, we'd been dating for about three months or so, and decided that we wanted to give uh, a life partner relationship a chance. And I looked around and said, I can't. I, I can't move in with you because you don't have a single empty closet in the place. <laughs> there was literally nowhere to put myself. Uh -huh. Every closet in every room, every corner was full. Uh -huh. There was no place for me to be. Um, and so the so the the amusing uh, resolution to that was that uh, because I had a certain amount of basic handyman skills, basically he wanted me to double the closet board closet bars in another closet so we could take all the clothes from that closet and hang them underneath the clothes in that closet and that's way I, that's how I got one empty closet but um, and, but that way you didn't have to get rid of absolutely anything but but the point being that if you're going to imagine anything you know if, if you're imagining a drawing you have to start with a blank sheet of paper mm -hmm. if you're going to imagine a relationship there has to be some physical space in which to put it. Mm -hmm. The the requirement, the the contingency of imagination is that it has to have a vessel in which to live. Mm -hmm. you, there's no such thing as disembodied imagination. Right. And once you have the imagination, once, <laughs> if you'll allow your imagination to go further than it ever has before with an understanding that you can exceed that. Mm -hmm. Wow, what can life contain at that point? And it, well, it would be like getting your first car uh, after you get your driver's license in high school and telling yourself, well, this is the last car I'll ever own. <laughs> oh. Boy. Yeah, instead of, the, instead of saying this is the first car I will ever own, Understanding there will be a succession, uh -huh. and possibly each one will have something more than the previous one. And isn't it fun to dream that, oh, one day I will have, uh, or one day I could drive, or w whatever, have that experience. And the thing is, when you're having that dream, you don't know what's going to exist 20 years from now, what's going to be on the market to experience. Well, and why limit yourself? Exactly. You know, to give yourself permission to believe that it could be anything. Uh-huh. You know, that you too have at least as much chance as anyone else of winning the lottery. Right. And with the way technology is going, you and I may, before we die, drive a hover car. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be just awesome? Um, well, or everything could go 100% electric. I mean, yes. that would be intelligent, too. But then, uh -huh. on the flip side, you know, things could go the other direction and go very, very badly. Mm -hmm. And we could all wind up walking because society is broken down. Right. Even if that were to happen, we would still have every bit as much potential as we have now yes. for creating a world of love and mutual respect. Mm-hmm. It's entirely up to us whether we have lots of technology or none. It's entirely up to us how we're going to define and orchestrate and demonstrate our relationships. When you speak of a relationship, there's that magical feeling to realize, wow, uh, life will continue and I may have a time where I need to be held. And look, I've got someone to hold me. Wouldn't it be wonderful to play with your imagination that you could build a life where you have a choice of people to hold you when you need to be held? That you could build an organism of love? That. Well, what about the reestablishment of a village? Yes. You know, that instead of worrying about whose children belong to which parents, 
that it's simply the children of the village. Uh huh. And instead of saying, well, they're your parents or, or so and so's grandparents or whatever, they're the village's grandparents. And we don't lock them away someplace where they're forgotten, but instead they have dozens, if not hundreds, of people all concerned about how they're doing because they're the grandparents of the village, even the elderly men and women who have never had children themselves. The, I love the story of the, the city guy who goes to visit his friend in the small town. Mm -hmm. And um, they get out of their car at the store and the city guy locks the door. And the guy from the small town says, oh, you don't have to worry about locking it. You're the only one from the city and I got my eye on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, what can we allow? Mm -hmm. What can start with imagination and and let anything else happen let the flat tire be an amazing experience let the the <laughs> I, I don't remember the whole list but it was uh somebody had found this list of you know you've grown up in a small you know you live in a small town when uh -huh. and i remember one of them was something like you you tried to go jogging for exercise <laughs> And every car that goes by wants to give you a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go jogging, gee. <laughs> Everybody keeps wanting to give me a ride. Uh, yes. Um, Can you imagine a life that filled with love, that filled with um, a desire to help or... Uh, well, the only thing that's standing between us and the realization of that is ourselves. Yes. You know, it's our imagination and our ingenuity and our innovation, our invention, you know, that that we can look at each other as collaborators instead of competitors. You know, that if we all work together, anything's possible. And I mean, I, I'm very fond of the, what you might call the Amish barn raisings approach mm -hmm. to life. The idea that it doesn't even require a huge amount of technology if everybody shows up and does what they can. You know, and... and I don't know if there's anyone who's unfamiliar with the metaphor, but it's it's basically that among the Amish, there is such an emphasis on hand tools and community collaboration that when they want to build a barn for somebody, the entire community comes together, you know, dozens, hundreds of them even, mm -hmm. and they literally build a barn from the ground up in a single day. Yes. Without any power tools. Uh-huh just by everyone showing up. Uh, I, in the movie Witness, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a scene depicting that. And I was watching with a friend many years ago and they showed this scene of this frame of a barn with all these Amish men all over it. And the person sitting next to me laughed and said, it looks like a bunch of ants on an anthill. Yes. And I suppose that's a worthy metaphor, you know, and an anthill really is an incredibly complex engineering. Uh, all those tunnels and everything for literally hundreds of ants. Uh, and yet, every single ant is basically moving one grain of sand at a time. Mm -hmm. you know, but the job gets done. And quickly and amazingly. What's also fun is where all that commonality comes in. Mm -hmm. What's also delightful is the divergence, if you allow it. Okay. Um, one thing I've been noticing recently is I'm running into people, again, our age, who don't have no spiritual background, and all of a sudden they're seeing dead people, or all of a sudden they're seeing things happen before they happen. So these are people having spiritual visions that the grand administrators of institutionalized religion would consider to be inappropriate choices or they they have nothing to base it on in other words uh, well, and it, consequently an unqualified inappropriate choice right there there you are know, it, it's like asking god why do you speak through a kindergarten child instead of through a, uh, a professionally trained scribe exactly uh, because the kindergartner is so much smarter but anyway well, the uh, kindergartner <laughs> may be more honest yes exactly scribe, may or may not be particularly honest anymore, and God may need someone really honest for this particular message. Well, what frightens so many of them is, what now what does this mean? And so many people will come to see me because 
I don't have dreadlocks and I don't have body piercings and tattoos and and I don't scare them okay. and I'm normal and you don't have long <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so it's easier for them but what is fun is then checking back with them months or a year later Mm -hmm. where now their life contains people with face paint and and dreadlocks and and uh, Armani suits. Saying forever that you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but most people do. Uh huh. You know, and the, the, unfortunately, by by doing so, they they short themselves. They cheat themselves of all sorts of valuable resources. You know, imagination, ingenuity, innovation. The only way that any of those work is by allowing things in that are unfamiliar. If you have, want to have a delightful time at a party, next time you're at a party, look for the person who's trying to hide. Okay. And speak with them. You're going to find something amazing. I have found some of the well, most... And initially you'll probably find a person who thinks that they're unwelcome. Yes. You know, or, or feels so ill at ease because of their difference. Mm-hmm. And if we instead approach that person and and communicate to them that I consider your difference to be an, undis an undiscovered treasure. Exactly. Not a justification for isolation. Yes. And what experience do you get from that growing? And talk about a great party. Do you want to go to a party where once you're done, you know everything about the current events, the, the most popular celebrities and all the current sports scores or do you want to experience that person nobody else did that mm. took you to a place you couldn't have imagined because you know going to talk to that very quiet person they're not going to go where you expect mm. they are going to be different they choose to be different and that's why they don't feel comfortable at the party so. but they may not even choose to be different well it, it they may, believe themselves to be different. You know, for me, I don't know that it's a choice. I don't know that it's about my own belief. It's about looking in the mirror and noticing I am different. Yes. You know, it's it's not even about trying to be different. It, in some mm -hmm. cases, you know, like that quiet person in the corner at the party trying to maintain a low profile because I'm not really wanting to upset or, or make anyone else uncomfortable. But in, in many cases where I've been in that situation, I, don't, I myself don't really even know why I'm there. Mm -hmm. You know, except that the host or a hostess said they wanted me there. They, well, you're a friend of mine, please come. So I came, but I don't know why you want me here because I, there's no conversation I can have with people. No, I'm, I'm not a Broncos fan, so if you want to talk <laughs> about football, it's going to be a very short conversation. Um, I there's just my life is on a different track and I don't know that I chose to make it on a different track as that I simply found the track that was authentically my life uh -huh. and I knew that if I lived authentically my life I wouldn't have any regrets mm -hmm. if I spent my life trying to be the embodiment of someone else's expectations and definitions it would never fit anyway. It would be nothing but disappointment. Uh huh. Embracing your differences. Again, you and I have this in common, and I enjoy that. When I was a child, I was that hyperactive child. Okay. Um, born in the mid 60s, my mom had a harness and leash for me. Now, that wasn't a common thing. You actually see it in the stores now, mm -hmm. actual <laughs> child leashes. My mom had me on a leash and harness because I was that active and that. Um, out of control? Out of control. Mm -hmm. Or you, you. Anyway, so I've spent my life being told I'm too much. I'm too much, I'm too much, I'm too much. And it was such a struggle for me until I realized, wait, I now live in a, a super cooked society who is looking at potentially the next evolution of mankind. Mm -hmm. You need too much here. 
<laughs> ah, I found my time. I found my place. I can be too much because that's what's needed. And isn't that delightful? Isn't it fun to be different and understand that's what's needed? Well, it would make sense that God would need some people who are too much to compensate for the people who weren't doing enough. <laughs> sure. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've had enough people, especially early in a relationship, friendship or whatever, they're saying, well, I'm guessing this is not going to be boring. And, and it isn't. And what a delightful thing to offer someone. This is not going to be boring. Mm -hmm. And uh, wouldn't it be wonderful for all well, of us to, to offer it? To the extent it? that they're willing to welcome it. Yes. The, the pain usually comes from people pushing back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I'm not going to try it, but I've been told that if you ever fall through a plate of glass, you won't get hurt as long as you don't pull back. Ah, uh, yes. Uh huh. As long as you keep moving with the glass, you'll go right through unscathed. Uh huh. But the minute you tense up or pull back, all of that glass around you is going to cut as it tries to pass you. Mm -hmm. And in a similar sort of way, you know, if you're afraid of something, if you're angry about something, whatever it is, the minute you pull back, the minute you resist, the minute you place yourself in an adversarial relationship, that's when the pain comes. Yes. And the damage comes. Unfortunately, it doesn't give me a lot of insight for understanding uh, a few personal recent attacks uh, on me. You know, people who wanted me to be something that I simply didn't have the ability to be. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I don't think I was resisting as much as just I could not measure up to what they wanted of me. I came across a, a statement I have had a lot of fun expanding on and what it was was what other people think of us has nothing to do with us now i can imagine i can see an argument both sides i could have a negative reaction to you because i was raised in a um catholic school and i've had my hands whacked by nuns with yardsticks exactly to which is probably a reference that doesn't make a lot of sense to the current generation who's never heard of it. But. but Yeah, but the concept that I could have a reaction to you because of that has how much to do with you. Um, the colors are similar. Is mm -hmm. about it. That's it. When I have a problem with another person, very seldom is it them. I had a delightful experience about two weeks ago. I didn't react well to a friend's wife and I had to stop after quite a bit of time and realize my reaction was I was projecting my first marriage onto this woman who doesn't know her and isn't her. And may not have even known that you had a first marriage. Exactly. And I had to say, my apologies. I need to start all over again. I projected onto you stuff that had nothing at all to do with you and they were dumbfounded they didn't know what to, how to respond to that simply because she looked somewhat like your uh, I mean, former potentially actually funny you would mention that i didn't even think of that aspect but again all i did was project on her and we do that to each other all the time mm -hmm. and when we can catch ourselves and say you know what um, can I have a mulligan on this one? <laughs> Here's a mulligan? What, uh, a a tryover. It's a um, golf term. Oh, okay. Um, getting a second, uh, a second chance. Okay. And it's probably another golf. Uh, I understand. But um, the the thing is, is to say, uh, I, I'm, my apologies. I did a very human thing. I did this one thing, mm -hmm. um, and I'm fully aware it has absolutely nothing to do with you. So. Let's try this again, <laughs> because I wasn't kind. She was totally unaware that it was going on, and mm -hmm. she really didn't have any problem or concern. Again, it was all on my side. One of the ways that, yes, I do console myself is to remind myself that this really has a lot more to do with them working out their issues than it has to do with me. If I can serve that purpose in their lives and they're better for it, I'm 
glad I could make that contribution, but, you know, please help me heal also because it's, it can be a really abrasive, difficult kind of wearing that I have to endure mm -hmm. uh, because of my willingness to serve that growth in someone else's life. Mm -hmm. um, we're about out of time here, but it, I guess a, a note to end on, uh, I, I do consider myself a 21st century nun because I'm, my focus is very specifically on serving the personal and spiritual growth of others. I recall an, an overworn um, anecdote that I heard many years ago of the of a group of nuns headed someplace on a windy day and and the wind catches their skirts and blows them up a little bit and someone commented that they had knees like camels uh, built up with lots and lots of castle uh, calluses uh -huh. because of how many thousands of hours they had spent on their knees in prayer uh -huh. you know that there is something about the calluses that we have to build up that testifies to the service we have bestowed. Uh, and I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back or anything, mm -hmm. but to say that for any of us, if we find calluses on our fingers, metaphorically speaking, to take that as a compliment that we have been faithful in whatever service to life we've been privileged to do. Indeed. Thank you for everything you've shared today. You bet. Thank you. And keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you for watching.